Welcome to Private Club Radio, the industry's first and only program dedicated to education, news, events, trends and announcements. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. Hey, welcome to episode number 19 of Private Club Radio. That's right, we had 18 great ones before this, so go back and check them out if you haven't heard them already. But today we're joined by Ray Cronin and Russ Condy of Club Benchmarking. We're going to be talking data, critical data that your club needs to know. Ray and Russ founded Club Benchmarking back in 2009, and we're going to find out what key revelations Club Benchmarking has had since they began measuring this data. And we're going to answer the age-old question, is it better to have a bigger club or a smaller one? There's going to be some incredible insights on this show. You're going to want to stay tuned. Are you searching for members? Are you looking to drive revenue to every department of your club? With Course Driver, you can. Course Driver is a custom smartphone application designed specifically for your club. Visit CourseDriver.com to schedule your demo today. A couple announcements before we bring on the guys from Club Benchmarking. First, from the Professional Club Marketing Association, their 2016 Florida Symposium on Membership and Marketing is happening Monday, June 6th from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. at the Isleworth Golf and Country Club in Windermere, Florida. It's going to be an exciting event. I'm speaking there on the seven elements of highly effective advertising. If you are in Florida or close to Florida, so all you Alabama, Georgia, Carolina folks, you're close enough, I think, you're going to want to make your way down here to Florida for that. Visit askpcma.com to get more information. And don't forget to check out Private Club Radio at the National Club Association's National Club Conference in Chicago, Illinois, next week. If you are in Chicago for that or for one of the other events that's happening that week, it's a pretty busy week for the private club industry there in Chicago, stop by my table and let's chat a little bit about your club, what makes it so unique Our listeners love to hear great stories, and you'll get to have your story told right here on Private Club Radio. So come by and visit me in Chicago. All right, I want to welcome Ray Cronin and Russ Condi of Club Benchmarking to the show. Gentlemen, welcome to Private Club Radio. Thanks, Gail. Russ, can you start out and give folks a little background about yourself? Uh, sure. I've been uh, now now part of uh, Ray and I started Club Benchmarking about uh, seven years ago, but Prior to that, I actually wasn't in the club world. I was more in the high tech world, um, on in more, mostly in the telecommunications industry. Um, I have a, a, a mechanical engineering degree from Syracuse University and an MBA, uh, and then um, went into the, to the telecom world for about a dozen years, and uh, left that world around 2000, 2002. And Ray and I actually started a, a an online business. Uh, back then, it was a it was a trade journal actually for the electronics manufacturing industry. We had that and sold that in around 2008. So you know, interestingly, my my inceptional background is not in the club world, but uh, you'll hear the story a little bit later on, I'm sure. But um, you know, now we've been doing this for seven years, and we consider ourselves very embedded in the club world. Oh, excellent. How about you, Ray? Can you give us a little taste of uh, what got you to club benchmarking? Sure. So, uh, as Russ said, we, we got to know each other and we actually get to know each other in the telecom industry. We worked at a company, uh, back in 1999 through say 2002, but we have a very similar background, engineering, undergrad MBA, uh, I guess you'd say we're data driven, you know, guys coming out of high technology. I became a member of the board of my own club about nine years ago. And uh, when I did become a member of the board, I realized that we had lots of discussions that uh, seemed that well, they'd be better served if they had data uh, to support the discussion. There's a lot of opinion, as we all know, in the private club boardroom. And uh, so after one particularly difficult meeting, I guess, uh, I called Russ and said, geez, I had an idea if... Uh, if the private club could compare their finances and operations to other private clubs, it probably would enhance the dialogue in the boardroom. <laughs> sure. So 
we uh, we decided to take the lead seven years ago, as Russ, Russ said, and we started club benchmarking. And I think the you know it took it pretty quickly. We realized that what I noticed going on in my old boardroom was not unique. It was actually pervasive. Uh, now that we've been doing it for seven years, we could say that very clearly that uh, these issues that exist, you know, private clubs are obviously unique, but but ultimately they are businesses. And there's not many industries that have been left untouched by data uh, at this point in the evolution of business. And we're just bringing that same process and the same type of data to the private club boardroom that's existed in for-profit boardrooms for the last 20 years. I like the catchphrase I've heard you use a few times. Uh, you say you're elevating fact over opinion in the decision-making process. Can you tell listeners why that is so crucial? Sure. I think that uh, if you sit in the private club boardroom, the average club, uh, the average board has 11 members of the club on the board. And those 11 people come from very disparate backgrounds. They, they, they're, they cover the entire spectrum of industry, lawyers, doctors, uh, every every facet of industry. And there's not a lot that exists other than opinion. Everyone has a, has a thought as to what's going on or why it's going on, but without fact, it's hard to align the opinion because ultimately I would suggest the most confident most extroverted and maybe even quote unquote the loudest person in the room kind of controls the conversation by their personality. But they may or may not know what the question is, or they may or may not know what the answer is. And certainly if you can lay data on the table, it's very aligning. It it helps people make obviously make better decisions. And it just everyone just gains insight. Everyone ultimately can understand what the business of a private club is as opposed to uh, trying to imprint their own view of what business is from their own background. So you need that common that common feel, that common viewpoint, and we believe that that stems from having data, a fact, as opposed to opinion. Russ, a question for you. How do you actually determine what types of data should be measured? Uh, well, it's interesting. When we started out, uh, of course, we were new to the industry and new to the to the concept that we were bringing to the industry. So we sort of started out, I would say, almost as a traditional survey in the industry, but obviously with with applying technology and that we had it online with all kinds of reporting and filtering capabilities. But you know, we started out basically by by just by collecting lots of data. And then frankly, that's when the real work, that's sort of the easy part. The real work began by, and it's never ending, we're still learning today, by really analyzing the data and and letting, you know, unlike the boardroom where you walk into the room thinking you know what the problem already is, we didn't, I think the the value of us not being club guys originally is we didn't start the business with preconceived notions, uh, frankly, a lot of them incorrect about how the industry operates. So we basically had this pile of data from a thousand plus clubs. And as Ray said, we're kind of business data guys and we just dove in, and this is this is now over a, you know a two or three year span initially. Dove in and just started asking questions and analyzing and digging and looking at different ratios and looking at correlations and seeing, hey, the clubs that seem to have operational break even or better, what do they look like? The ones that throw off capital, what do they look like? And we really let the data define for us what what the important metrics are to measure, and and that's critical because no one can digest you know, 300 different data points and tell a story around it. But when you can boil up to the surface, what are the data points that are important? Now you've got 10 or 15 things, which every burst, every business person in every boardroom can can understand and digest. And that's, that's really what we did. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's basically the punchline of all that is it allowed us, as Ray said, to look at clubs like a business. So we look at things like, you know, gross margins and dues ratios and, and capital ratios and, 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 you know, debt ratios and, and all the things, frankly, that any other business would look at. So it's, it was really an exercise of letting the data tell us what's important as opposed to us going in and saying, here's what we think is going to be important. Sure. And where is the data actually coming from? Is it from uh, club CRM systems? Are you putting out questionnaires? Where, how are you actually collecting this data? Yeah, we get data really from two main uh, uh, pipes, if you will. 
One is uh, from our subscribers. We've got about 600 clubs that actually subscribe to our service. As part of that, they supply their annual data. And very simply, all they do is, is, is export a, uh, a, what they call a trial balance file from their accounting system. They send that to us, and then we map and upload their data. And that's critical because now every club that goes in, even though the clubs have unique chart of accounts, we, we map that in the same way for every club. So that's how, that's how the majority of data comes in. And then we've always worked very closely with the Club Managers Association of America. And we've been the, uh, 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 the engine, if you will, behind their quote unquote annual surveying process. So, you know, there's tremendous value in all this data going into one place. So that's the other conduit for the data is we're the engine for that, for, uh, for that survey. So folks that aren't subscribers, but, but want to still supply data for the industry benefit, you know, we get data from that way. We map it in the exact same way. And together, those two things really account for, you know, 99% of the data. Perfect. Um, what other industry players are you collaborating with? I know you mentioned just now the Club Managers Association of America. Are there any other associations or any other specific entities out there that you're actually collaborating with in order to build these effective data sets? Yeah, we, we really, you know, we consider ourselves uh, sort of the Switzerland of the industry. We're not, <clears throat> we don't really have an ax to grind. We're trying to obviously help clubs, help the industry. And we just know that, that, that having data in one place helps lots of different players. While primarily we're looking to help clubs, it, it's everybody using the same analysis and the same data. Uh, it just helps move the whole thing forward. So, you know, we work with CMAA. We work closely with the NCA, National Club Association. Uh, we work with the C, uh, let me get the, the letters right, CSFA, CSFA. CFSA, the Club Fitness and Spa Association. Um, we certainly work with, uh, um, we're actually starting to now work on the public side and we're, we're, you know, talking to some other associations, NGCOA, et cetera, that, that tend to work on the public side. And then we will work with a number of players that, um, uh, that are sort of in the consulting ecosystem, you know, the Bill McMahon, you know, McMahon group of the world, um, uh, you know, some of the, some of the search firms, uh, they are always looking for data. So, you know, we're, we're very generous with the data uh, in that, you know, we understand it moves lots of facets forward. And, and, and so we work, you know, we're, we're pretty open to work with anybody and, and often not on a monetary state, but just on a, hey, let's help these guys to help move their ball forward as well. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely vital to have the right data. So let's talk about the type of data. Ray, this question is going to be directed towards you, but let's get into the numbers a little bit. What are some of the more crucial metrics that every club should be aware of? Well, we have a uh, one report that we call our uh, executive dashboard report. And in that report, there are 15 metrics. And the, the fundamental, uh, as Russ said earlier, there's two fundamental concepts that, that are the foundation of that, those metrics and, and basically everything we report. The first one is we separate the operating and capital ledges very distinctly in the database. And then the second is that we overlay a business, just a standard business uh, income statement, if you will, or business framework on top of that. So we, we're into understanding what the gross margin of a club is, meaning what's the cost of revenue, the cost of producing the revenue. And we can show with the data that the very, as in any industry, the variation in gross margin has a, a significant impact on the variation in the bottom line. Does the club have an operating deficit or a surplus? So we kind of work through the income statement on both the operating and capital ledger, and we look for key ratios. I'll probably just to cite a few. I won't go through all 15, but a few that are very important and can be shown to correlate to financial success or lack thereof. One critical one is the membership dues revenue as a percentage of the total operating revenue. We call it the dues ratio. The industry median is 50%. And we can show that clubs that have a dues ratio in the lower quartile, 60% of them run with an operating deficit, whereas clubs that have a dues ratio in the upper quartile, only about 20% of them have an operating deficit. So the dues ratio, because dues revenue 
is high gross margin revenue, if you will, with the if the if you think about the razor blade business analogy, dues revenue is the blade. That's where you make your money, and the other services and amenities the club offers are more like food and beverage is a particular example, are more like the razor. So you may not make so much money on the specific amenity, but it's there intended to bring in the blade business, which is dues revenue. So the dues ratio is a critical ratio. Uh, the gross margin is affected by the ratio of dues and F and D. We can show that. So every club should know what their gross margin is. The median for the industry is 60%. So it's the gross profit, which is the gross margin, you know, divided by the revenue with the gross profit is the amount of revenue after you produce, but the amount of profit you have after you produce your revenue to cover the fixed expenses of the club, the fixed operating expenses. The median 60%, every club should know where they are on that measure because, again, we can show lower gross margin means more likely operating deficit and higher gross margin means more likely operating surpluses, which is very much common sense. That's a critical ratio. And then just to jump over to the capital ledger for a moment, one of the most important metrics we believe is what we call the net available capital ratio. And that's the amount of money a club has to make capital investment and or pay down principal on debt. Uh, and we think you can relate that back to operating revenue. We believe a club should have between 12 and 15% of its operating revenue year in and year out is net available capital. And we can show that clubs that are capital starved, which has a ratio of, say, a 5% or less, versus clubs that are capital rich where that ratio is up around 16 or 17 percent, we can show very distinctly that there's certain profiles or certain characteristics that contribute mightily to whether you have a low ratio net available capital or a high ratio. And you can see from the data that clubs that have more members have higher initiation fees, uh, essentially having greater financial success at clubs with a higher net available capital ratio. And one of the the great goals, frankly, of a private club is to go through the process of understanding where the net available capital is and how the club is going to increase that ratio as they look forward down the road. Those are just three examples. There's about 12 other metrics that we have in that single report, but those three are probably three of the most critical that, that uh, we start with. And then we use the others to kind of fill in the, the, the more, more uh, subtle colors of the story. I see. So are you guys able to show clubs how they're doing in relation to other clubs in their market and in relation to other clubs in the country or in the world? How does it work? Yeah, we can. We have the, the database, uh, the, the, the software platform, I should say, which is accessible via the Internet, allows users to use different metrics or different fact uh, different data points if you will for for the filter you can use revenue you could use geographic location uh, you could use initiation fee number of members any any metric in the database is over there's almost 400 metrics in the database finance and operations any metric can actually become a filter the, the, the platform in standard use has about 10 or 12 of those metrics but it's interesting what we've shown with the data, contrary to conventional wisdom, is that these ratios that we talk of, these critical ratios, they're, they're very, very consistent. They don't vary as a result of geography. They don't vary as a result of size. They don't vary as a result of really quality of a club. There's a, there's a preconceived notion in the club industry and, and I think part of it is because the industry is so fragmented. You know, if you think about the club industry and compare it to a typical industry, the club industry is about a you know, $20, $25 billion industry. And the largest single club is about $100 million in revenue. So it's extremely fragmented in terms of the norms. Right. And as a result, it's diff- more difficult to disseminate information across the industry by, by definition. And so there's some preconceived notions that exist that are intuitive, but probably not correct. The one is that where the club is or how big the club is or how nice the club is has an impact on its business model. And we can show with data that we like to say 
the, the, the variation that results in the industry, it doesn't result as a matter of circumstance, where we are, how big we are, how nice we are. It results as a matter of choice. What choices do we make and how do those choices impact the outcome? And, and the whole fundamental driver for what we're doing now and for these key performance indicators and these key ratios is to illuminate the choices that clubs make. Sometimes I would say even more often than not unconsciously and how those choices impact the outcome. And you really can't see that. You really can't embrace the effects of those choices without two, A, data, you need data, and B, you need the comparative effect of the data. So it'd be like saying, I'm going to give you a cholesterol reading. Your cholesterol is 200. But if you don't have that benchmark in comparison, if you don't know what the range is of low to high and normal and abnormal, then that number means nothing. So you need the number, but you also need a comparative background to understand what you're seeing. Exactly. Well, your platform sounds quite robust. Um, I know you guys have had some key revelations, Russ, since 2010. What are some of those key revelations you've had when you guys have been analyzing this data? I think there there have been a few models that we've come out with that uh, that I think a lot of people listening will be familiar with. <clears throat> One, when we initially, uh, the first, I think, major breakthrough was probably now four years ago. And it was when, when you know, Ray coming out of one of his own board meetings again, and which which is, again, you know, has the frustrations of every other board meeting. <laughs> and there was a discussion around, you know, again, for an hour around food and beverage and the financials of food and beverage. And and with the the assumption of all the members of the board, other than Ray, of course, was that, you know, the club is like is 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 a uh, reliant on the result of food and beverage to for the financial success of the club. And it's a small club, so they don't, you know, they don't, uh, uh, it doesn't, they can't afford a big subsidy into food and beverage. So it breaks even. It doesn't take cash from the club. It doesn't supply cash in the club. Yet every month they talk about it like it's critical to the finances of the club. So, so I'm just, I'm getting to the, you know, he asked himself the question, you know, given that, where does the money to run this club come from and where does it go? And to short circuit that, uh, the result of that after, you know, 100 hours or so of work, was what we then called the the available cash model. Uh, today we call it we we've morphed it into more standardized terms. We call it the financial insight model. And inside that model is where we generate the things like gross profit, gross margin, uh, uh, you know, the food and the food and beverage result ratio. So that that model, which is is now the financial insight model, was critical. And it, and it, it it's not to be repetitive to what Ray said, but it. It it uh, it it has the same a lot of those operational and capital uh, metrics that pop out of that. That was one. Uh, another that we're really sort of just working on now, people might find interesting, is capital investment in the industry has never had a robust discipline behind it. Quite often, and in in private industry, in in tech, the tech world, if you're going to do a large capital project. Uh, there, there is, there is, uh, you know, a high degree of diligence that goes around that, and, and frankly, that diligence is culminated with a, hey, what's the return on investment? What's the internal rate of re on return? What's the return on equity? Return of assets? You know, for this capital investment, you can't stand up in a in a room of a thousand shareholders and say, we're going to build a new plan for for a billion dollars just because we think it's a good idea. <laughs> right? You have to lay out the diligence behind it. Sure. If that doesn't really happen in the club industry, so. The model where we're actually sort of just rolling out now has to do with capital investment and the notion of return on investment, return on equity in a club. And, and the way that return can be measured is if you're if you're uh, doing a large capital investment in a club that should have the ramifications of of uh, uh, member value proposition and member value proposition is often measured in what's the initiation fee of the club. And so if you're taking on a large capital project, you at least should do the diligence to say, is this going to allow us to increase our initiation fee two years from now when this project is done? And that, in effect, you know, becomes the, the, the return on capital in, invested, as opposed to, frankly, a lot of places that people invest money uh, that, that 
may, might be more towards the banquet side or might be towards the side that that doesn't really have a, a, a net return from a capital perspective. And, and I think the more that clubs can start utilizing standard business acumen and diligence, the more they're A, going to understand their business model much more completely, and B, can answer the simple question, are we financially sustainable, right? Is this an ongoing entity that's got some runway to it, or every year do we seem to be, you know, just making sure we can get through another year? And the best clubs in the country are the ones that do have that runway ahead of themselves. They do think about how do we increase the value proposition for current and future members, and it's not it's not a it's a value based entity, it's not a cost control based entity. And and I think clubs so we're so that it's a long answer, but but we're working on some models now that uh, that bring a lot of new insight into the capital investment side. Well, that's a big differentiation you make. I think it's a, certainly an important one. Now, seeing all this data, you guys have to be getting kind of a big picture view of the club industry as a whole. What are some of the trends you guys are spotting? Um, I, I'd say this, that there is a tale. We, we often refer to the tale of two cities. Uh, a quarter of the clubs, private clubs that we have in our database, which we think is fairly representative of the industry, given the amount of data we have. About a quarter of the clubs in the industry are under severe financial stress. As Russ said earlier, they, the, the indication would be they don't have a uh, sustainable financial model looking out five, ten years. About a quarter of the clubs, on the other hand, are uh, really doing well. They have a, a very strong model. They have plenty of capital to invest. They invest that capital and they get a return on it, as Russ said, by increasing member count, increasing initiation fees, essentially increasing demand for their club. And then you get the other 50% of clubs, which I just I think we could characterize from the data as, uh, let's say, doing you know they 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 have a sustainable model, but they're more moving sideways than moving forward with vigor. So you kind of get those three buckets. Um, it would appear, as we've been since we've been gathering data, the first year for which we gathered data was 2009, which was right in the heart of the economic meltdown. Right. It it would appear from the data that the clubs that are in stress, their stress has been increasing over time. It hasn't been getting better, and the clubs that are doing well have been getting stronger. Hmm. Um. So I. You know, I think that's a, a critical trend for anyone on a board of a private club or anyone involved in managing a private club to understand. I think that during the meltdown, we know that the club industry was under stress. There's no question, and that stress was, let's say, widespread. But since the meltdown, maybe analogous to our economy at large, uh, not all boats have floated higher, <laughs> if right. that makes sense. Sure. But but certainly some have. And and you know, so that's that's one key trend. The other key trend is clearly in in our model, the financial insight model, we can actually quantify by the way clubs spend money, we can quantify clubs that are more golf centric versus clubs that are, let's say, have brought a base of amenities and services than just golf, which of course would include fitness and personal wellness and spa and many other things. And you can see with the data uh, that the clubs that have a broader base of amenities, broader offering, have a healthier outcome at this point. So we like to... The, 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 the pie slice that shows where the money goes in a club that relates to non-golf sports is yellow. And we like to say, you know, if you follow the yellow, you can see that there's a higher initiation fees, more members, more capital income in clubs that have a broader base of amenities, which makes sense. I'm an avid golfer. I love golf. But golf, you know, generally speaking, since the early 2000s has been a game that under stress as well in terms of participation rates. There's just at the uh, National Golf Symposium 
meeting last week in Chicago, and a, and a big chunk of that dialogue was about how do we increase the participation rates in golf because we need to increase them. Right. But but you can see that trend too. So clubs that you know that are less golf centric probably uh, are doing better, generally speaking, than clubs that are more golf centric. And what would be the those are two big trends. What would be the num- number one thing? Would it be fitness and, and the wellness facility that's actually driving um, some of these clubs that are outperforming the others, or is there another um, particular revenue stream that you're seeing that's really giving a boost to some of these clubs? It's it's interesting that it. It, it is that fit, no doubt the fitness and then all the group exercise. So that's that whole umbrella of that broad umbrella of non-golf sports. So that's fitness and Pilates and yoga and spinning and physical therapy, you know, just more, more services that are related to the, to the well being of a, of a person. And probably to, and the, then, to the, to the wife and the children, big, not just the men as well. I would think it's more of a absolutely, family no activity. Question. It, that activity, all that activity, that whole wellness centric view, that's family based without question. Sure. Uh, the other big trend I think you'd be, you're familiar with, and I'm sure many of your uh, interviewees are familiar with, uh, is this trend towards what we'll call casual dining, mm-hmm. uh, where clubs put facilities in place that really mirror where you would go if you weren't going to the club on a Friday or Saturday night, you know, that nice local upscale pub, if you will, that's family friendly as well, but you don't have to wear a suit or a tie or a sport coat. You can wear denim, you know, just that kind of casual uh, dining with a lot of TVs. That's a big trend in the industry, which broadens again, that broadens the appeal of prospective members. I think the whole, the key healthy trend we believe is that, and you, I think we can see it with the data, just the broader the offerings, the broader the appeal a club has to across uh, age, gender, uh, just the broader the appeal, the more healthy the club will be And that broader appeal manifests itself in higher demand by pr- prospective members. And the, the narrower the focus of the club, the narrower the restrictions that are related to the use of the club, then the narrower the demand will be for that club by prospective members. And that'll manifest itself in lower initiation fees and less members. Right. So one last question then, as it, re- as it relates to the actual data here, is there any areas of the country that you see are a little bit more healthier than others, or is it pretty flat across the United States? I think it's, um, I think it's pretty consistent when we look at when we gauge, uh, I would say, a degree of health. I wouldn't so much make it a ge- geographic based, but but more size of club based. Got it. Um, it's it's pretty clear. You know, Ray mentioned coming out of 2009 and, and you know, I, it, that's it's hard to believe it. But that's now seven years behind us. And so, a the clubs that are out there still sort of you know, blaming their woes on 2009, you know, have to get on with it and figure it out. But, but I think what we do see is that smaller clubs are struggling more than larger clubs. The larger clubs did come out, I think just maybe by sheer inertia or horsepower, you know, did come out of that downturn more quickly and more completely. So there is clearly a different, a differentiation uh, of large versus small with the smaller, you know, struggling more. And I think, it has a lot to do with what Ray said. If you're a two and a half, three and a half million dollar club, it's hard for you to get the economic horsepower to make those trend changes, you know, the fitness, the casual dining, to invest that money to 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 keep yourself relevant, right? A lot sure. I use the t- the term relevant a lot. So so I think large versus small, you know, there are some places around the country where there's a high density of clubs. I mean, Naples, Florida was an area that, you know, struggled, you know, in that downturn. I think they've, they've come back, you know, you look out at, uh, at Palm Springs in California, where there's an intense density of clubs. I would say they're more challenged. Uh, but I, I think that I would say it's more of a large versus small than it is a geographic based issue. And when you say large versus small, is that in terms of the actual membership size, in terms of the uh, dues revenue or the initiation fees? Can you just explain that a little bit further? 
Yeah, we we break the we break the revenue. When we say large versus small, we mean the operating revenue of the club. And we break based on the data. We break the industry into into four. You know, if you think about a pie chart with four segments, the small clubs are those that are uh, let's say three and a half million dollars of operating four, revenue. Four and a half. Uh, I'm sorry, four and a half and 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 less. And then you've got uh, you know from four and a half to about seven mm-hmm. is is that next group of clubs. And then what, Ray? Seven to probably ten. Yeah, it's four and a half to six and a half, six and a half to nine and a half, and then above. Yeah. So above nine and a half is is large. So that's how we break up the industry. Well, that's how the data, you know, has told us to break up the industry based on size. So when we say size of club, we generally talk about the operating revenue of the club. Right. Would you say that clubs that have a higher due structure and uh, are are actually in a better position or would, or is it better to have more actual members? So basically would it, would it be better to have a, a healthy club of 200 members that are paying higher dues or, a, or a club that has 700 members that might have lower rates. Is there anything that you can yeah. see in the data that uh, is well, one is better than the other? It's, it's really interesting and it's a great question, but you can see very clearly that th- there are choices involved with this, but, as Russ said, the, as the industry breaks up, and I'm going to actually open up the slide as we're here. I'm going to read some data to you, which is it's really interesting. I want to get it right, so I'll read it off the slide. But sure. um, but but to the question, which is is great, clubs. It, it's about dues mm-hmm. revenue. That's the key. What's the total dues revenue? And and Russ and I and the team at Club Benchmark often refer to the dues engine. And the goal of every club is to increase dues revenue because if that is the fundamental driver of gross profit and margin and that's the fundamental driver of what you can spend on your expenses and but you, we talk about the dues engine and we think of it as there's two things that drive dues revenue how many people belong and how much it costs to belong right what you can see from the data and this again is counterintuitive but if you were to poll a whole bunch of board members of private clubs randomly and you would ask them a nicer clubs much more expensive than less nice clubs the answer probably instinctive would be a hundred percent yes but the data shows the opposite that the nicer clubs are not necessarily more expensive but they do have more members so there's some of the nicest clubs in this country that when you look at the amount you pay annually to belong, it's the same as the most pedestrian clubs in the country. Now, they'll have a higher initiation fee, no question about it. It'll cost more to join, but once you're in, the cost of belonging isn't greatly different. But they get that critical mass of dues revenue by having a lot of members. And if you go back through that chain, it's perfectly logical. They have the dues revenue to make the investments, as Russ said earlier, they have more members because they make, they have more to offer. And since they have more to offer, what's going to happen? They have a broader perspective member demand. And where's that effect? Higher initiation fee. And it's kind of like the virtuous cycle. Right. So clubs don't have to good, nice clubs don't have to get there by being more expensive. That being said, there are some clubs that have less members and they are more expensive and that's a choice. They choose to keep it, let's say smaller and more exclusive, but that's not the primary driver, if that makes sense. That makes absolute sense. <laughs> and then I'll just, I'm going to read you this data because I think the listeners will, will find this uh, compelling and very interesting. So back to Russ in, you know, breaking up the industry into those four buckets. So this four quartel, if you take the industry and you just break it out on those revenue lines that we said earlier, and this is just clubs with golf. The same phenomenon is true in clubs without golf. But if you look at the lower quartile of the industry, the median initiation fee is $4,250. And the median member count is about 300 full member equivalent. If you look at the next, the next, larger, the next up quartile, that initiation fee jumps to twelve five, And the full member equivalent count goes to three sixty. You go up to the third quartile, the initiation fee goes to twenty five grand, and the full member equivalent count goes to almost five hundred. 
And then in the fourth quartile, the largest quartile, those large clubs, the initiation fee jumps to 60 grand and the full member equivalent jumps to almost it was 750 essentially. Wow. But the dues, the, the amount of member pays across those quartiles, those other numbers are jumping exponentially, but the amount of it costs to belong to the club is only varying across those quartiles by 30% or so. Hmm. So much less variation in the amount of cost to, to belong every year. Wow, that's eye-opening, uh, and I'm sure listeners uh, can can draw some conclusions from that data. And of course, going to your website and actually signing up for one of your um, data packages. But in addition to the, these data sets you provide, your firm also has a number of other services, one being board advisory services. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Well, we we don't, as Russ said earlier, we really, we, we don't, we're not consultants, but what we do is we we do visit many, many boards every week actually now and what we do is we basically do a presentation that's about 90 minutes in length and it's two two segments the first segment is using the data to explain using our financial insight model and the data to explain the business of the private club to the board and i would i would say that uh, with without exception and i mean this literally 100 percent of the time people their eyes are open wide and their heads are just snapping left and right because they're learning things that A, they never heard and B, uh, eye-opening for them. They have completely different views. I could tell you stories for the next half hour on (laughs) things people have said after that first 45 minutes. And then we use that knowledge that we've gained to look at their own club. So it's kind of like, we're going to tell you what an MRI of a club is. It's this financial insight. And then we're going to actually look at the MRI of your own club. And recently I had the really great experience, frankly, of being in front of a a smaller board, nine members, very open-minded people, very nice club. But frankly, they, they, the intuition and the opinion was ruling the day for a long period of time in the club. The club isn't unhealthy, but it's making decisions that are probably not the right ones. It was supposed to be a thirty minute, a ninety minute presentation. It ended up being three hours. So it went from six to nine, and the board stayed in the room until one a.m. From nine a.m. to one a.m. After I left, discussing what they had just heard and how it kind of completely changed their view of what their role was and what decisions they were involved in making, how how they had to change the decision. And so, you know, back to the beginning when we started the interview. This concept of elevating fact over opinion, it absolutely can make the healthier clubs. And and it's an eye opener and you know, we're on a mission and we do travel around and in in let's say generate data for, for clubs, but all with the passion and the purpose of it's it's a it's a real task to be on the board of your club. I've been on the board of mine for nine consecutive years and it takes an enormous amount of energy and gumption because it's it's a very it's a very socially charged environment as we know a club. And anyone that's been on a private club that's hearing this now board will agree. It's not the easiest thing you could choose to do. You do it as a labor of love. But we are on a mission to help that labor of love be more productive for the club over the long term. And we are absolute believers that data, in fact, will have no question a positive impact on the outcome. Excellent. Now, last question before uh, we wrap things up, we're going to move from what we've been talking about, very objective, we're talking about data, to something a little bit more subjective. Um, We call this the bucket list. So, Ray and Russ, if there's one club in the world that our listeners need to see before they die, in your opinion, what club would that be? We'll start with you, Russ. Uh, Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you're not going to like it, but I'm probably going to punt on this a little bit because, you know, I, I've, I've now seen, you know, hundreds of clubs. And the thing that's impressed me about the industry is the number of really, really, really nice clubs, but they're not household names. They're clubs that, you know, unless you're in the area, nobody's ever even heard of. And some of them are really nice because maybe you like, you know, kind of the big grand, you know, bold statement, big stone, you know, clubhouse type thing. So 
Some of them are really nice because they're a 120 year old small New England club on a lake that nobody ever heard of. And but it's had the same family, you know, generational membership for the last hundred years. And you can just feel it oozing out of the out of the club and out of the woodwork. And so it's just I guess my thought would be, you know, see as many of them as you can. And and it's again punting on the which one's the nicest, but there is just a, a ton of beautiful, nice clubs of all different shapes and sizes. And I'm going to just keep enjoying seeing as many as I can. So. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll consider that punting to Ray. So Ray, what, what's the one club <laughs> on your list? <laughs> now, now your back's yeah, against the uh, wall to answer this. <laughs> well, I'll say this, maybe, maybe following up with Russ, it's the political season. So we have to be very uh, coy with our answers. <laughs> sure. But, but um, it's interesting. I, We've we've had the fortune, and we're, I'm very grateful. I know Russ is of, of visiting so many so many great clubs. The thing that I love about the great clubs, and, and it's it, it ranges from my own, you know, which was founded in 1900. One of the things I love, as Russ just said, about these these great clubs is the history that goes alongside them. Um, you know, when you walk into the the locker room at the Country Club in Brookline, or San Francisco Golf Club, or some of the really old golf clubs where there's been great matches, and you see the the locker room still looks like it did when the club was first built. Mm-hmm. It's it's really neat to be part of that history. Some of the great city clubs I happen to be in the at the Cosmos Club in Washington D.C. a week or two ago, and uh, when you see the you see the club in the in the library, like the University Club of New York has a library. There's so much history in these clubs that such a fabric of uh, country and, and culture. And frankly, without the clubs, that, that history would probably not be preserved. Uh, I, I love seeing any club that has that deep history. And then there's some newer clubs that are building that history. So, But, you know, there's so many great golf courses and, and clubs, you know, the congressional, the country clubs, the San Francisco golf clubs, the Augusta National League. These are all just just tremendous pieces of our culture, and, and you know, I'm grateful to see them all. But I think that anyone that's involved in private clubs, you know, I'd say this: the more you can see, whether it's the great clubs, the the smaller clubs that may be less well known but still have a distinct history, anything you can do to go out and see these other clubs, it helps. You know, all of us understand that. You know, again, contrary to conventional wisdom, we're not alone. Each club is not an island. We're actually part of a community. And there's a lot of similarities and commonalities that exist in these various clubs that can help us in each of our own clubs. And when we look at the great clubs, you can you can learn from them and you can learn how they became great and how they've made themselves sustainable over a long period of time. And usually it's because they're very focused on a on a mission, on a vision that they've, you know, carried forward through many years. Although it's adaptable, it doesn't stay rigid, it doesn't stay static, it does evolve over time, and and that's what makes a great club. All right, well, we'll accept that answer. Now, how do folks find out more about you guys? How do they find out more about club benchmarking and use some of the great tools you guys have put together? Yeah, I think the easiest thing is just go to uh, clubbenchmarking.com and and poke around on there. You'll learn about what it is we do as a business and uh and the different subscription packages you can uh, clubs can can use but there's also a ton of information on there between the blogs between there's a great set of videos that are very topical based and 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 address the issues that people you know tackle with every day so i think it's just spend time on the website and then obviously feel free to reach out to us there's a place on the website where you can you can schedule a demo with us or just drop one of us an email or a phone call and and, um, you know, it, 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 it only helps having more information and more ammunition to help the club make right decision, uh, only moves things forward. And, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're doing it, you know, one club at a time. So it is a labor of love for us, but, but that's the, that's the best way to learn more about us, I think. Excellent. And then obviously we do a lot of, uh, a lot of chapter education sessions around the country for CMA and HFTP. So any chance that uh, we're in the area, uh, you know, that's a great way to have a live discussion around a lot of the things we've learned about the industry. Beautiful. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, Russ, for being on Private Club Radio. You were a wonderful guest. Hope to have you on again maybe next year. Thank you, Gabe. Thanks, Gabe. 
Just some fantastic information from those gentlemen right there. Hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to come back next week. We are going to be chatting with Bill Booth of the Booth Group. We're going to be talking technology, and you're going to find out what your club needs to know in terms of technology. And Mr. Booth is going to open up his crystal ball and tell us what advancements he sees coming down the road. I'm a real geek for that kind of tech stuff. I think that our industry is going to be shifting very, very soon in the next five to 10 years. It's going to look drastically different because of some of the advancements that are happening that Bill's going to tell us about. That's what this show is all about. It's all about giving you a leg up on the competition. I want you to be aware of what's coming down the road and what to prepare for. Now, between now and then, don't forget to check out privateclubradio.com. Listen to all the past episodes, read some of the show notes, and get a little bit more detail on our show guests. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, you can apply right there at privateclubradio.com. Don't forget, we have 18 episodes, as I mentioned at the beginning of this show, 18 episodes filled with solid gold for you to listen to or even re-listen to. There's so many great insights we've had. And it's good to go back every once in a while. And you'll get even more profound insights because we've had so many fantastic guests on the show. We're so very lucky to have really the best minds in the private club industry here on Private Club Radio. So I hope to see you back here next Monday. And until then, here's to your membership success. Just because this round is over doesn't mean you can't enjoy the 19th hole. Check out privateclubradio.com for more. Private Club Radio is brought to you by Shake Creative, the premier marketing and design firm helping prestigious clubs increase and retain their membership. Visit shaketampa.com to learn more.